All right. Dr. Russell? Yes. I couldn't find this PowerPoint on Blackboard. Is it on there? Yes. Where it's, is it? It's what is the, it under? It's in the course notes folder. Okay. Yeah, it should be there because I, I had to take out the animation so I could turn it into a, a handout. So, and I put it up there yesterday, not yesterday. After class Wednesday, I uploaded it. So it should be there. But let me let me do this while I still have this uh, chat window open. I can upload that too. Let me find it. I'll just put that in too. Because um, I know I printed it. I think I saved it to my desktop. Where are you, mine? Put that document. Give me one second. Oh, uh, gotta open Adobe. Maybe it'll open it from here. Got so much stuff to keep track of. I don't even know. I can't remember where I saved it, but let me find it. But I know I put it on Blackboard for sure. There we go. Why did I save this thing? Here we go. All right. Uh, let's save it to my desktop and I'll upload it to the chat. Come on, computer. All right, now I'll just put it in here. All right, <clears throat> so that, that PowerPoint is actually in the chat now. All right. Um, So let me go back to here. All right, so we're gonna talk about <clears throat> span splitting and the N plus one rule. And you should have seen that already, so it shouldn't be like foreign to you, but <clears throat> so when you have a, if you're doing proton NMR and you have a molecule that is, that has, um, 
hydrogens on adjacent carbons, then a lot of then what you'll see, what you'll notice is that um, those protons would couple with each other. That's the term we use. They'll couple with each other, and they'll cause what's, what's known as spin spin splitting, where each proton is going to experience the magnetic field of the other proton adjacent to it. All right. So you, the way you calculate like how many lines a signal is going to be split into is, is a real basic rule. It's called the n plus one rule. All right. So you have n plus one number of lines that that signal will be split into where n is equivalent to the number of hydrogens that are adjacent to it. All right. I know that sounds like a lot, but it's, it's a fairly simple concept. All right. So there are a lot of different splitting patterns, right? We call them multiplex. If you can be if it's split into two lines, it'll be a doublet, three lines will be a triplet, four lines a quartet, five lines a pentet, so on and so forth. But once you get past like uh, eight, eight lines, then you just call it a multiplet because a lot of times that's a that's a complex pattern. Uh, Sometimes it will be what you call a doublet of doublets or triplet of doublets, so on and so forth. We're going to talk about that probably on Monday. All right, so let's go back to here. <clears throat> and you can see again, we know where our signals are, right? Here is the black signal and it's a single line. But then when you look at the signal <coughs> for the orange protons, it's three lines, right? It's not just a single line. So your signals don't just show up as single lines in the spectrum, right? They, they show up and they show up as uh, these different multiplets based on how many protons are adjacent, right? The same thing over here, it's just a zoom of that, right? Of that other section, you can see this is one, two, three, four, five lines. This is one, two, three, four, five lines here. And then this signal is split into three lines. So it's two pentets and a triplet and another single. All right, so why is that? Let's go back to here, All right? Why is that this line is a singlet and this line here is a triplet? Well, look at, if we look at the protons that those signals represent, then we can figure that out. So this is the, this black line corresponds to these protons right here, right? And so if you look on the atom adjacent to it, this, which is the oxygen, there's no, there are no protons there, right? And, and so because there are no protons on that oxygen, that means that these protons on this side don't have anything to couple with. So if we apply the N plus one rule, let's see if I can annotate this. I'm not gonna write though. So how many, if, if we were looking at these protons right here, how many neighbors would you say these protons had? That's what, I always use that term N for neighbors. So how many neighbors? Wouldn't it be one? Look on the because oxygen. Zero. Yeah. Because because the two the two um orange hydrogens are two, considered as one, right? They're too far away. They have to oh, be, it's not adjacent. They be adjacent. Okay. They gotta be adjacent. I'm glad I like the I, I like that what you what how you're thinking, but they're too far away. They have to be right on the next atom. So if you look on oxygen, somebody already said it, N is zero. Right, so n should be lowercase n. N is zero. So when we do n plus one, right, is one. So that line, that signal, is only going to be a singlet. It's going to be split. It's not going to be split at all. It'll just be a single line. Oh yeah, does that make sense? Yes. All right, let's do the next one. Right, you see for the orange, it's a triplet. See that? It's three lines. How many neighbors does it have? Now, when you're talking about finding the number of neighbors Two. and all that, go ahead. Two. Two right here, none right here. Is that right? Let me move this here. So over here, for this set of protons, you're looking at the atoms that are immediately adjacent. So it'll be this oxygen and this carbon. And the hydrogens on that carbon are what's going to split with the hydrogens here, right? So for that one, N will be two. And N plus one will be three. So that line, that signal 
is going to be a what we call a triplet. And then here we'll call this we call it a singlet. All right. Any questions about that? So you in order to determine the splitting pattern, you apply the n plus one rule. Now, if you have a um if you have a signal, right, and you wanna you wanna uh but you don't know what the structure is. If you have a triplet, that's it, that's automatically indicative of the fact that you have two protons neighboring that carbon. Give me one second. All right, sorry about that. So you have singlet, you have a triplet for those. Let's go to the next one and let me clear this off. Uh, all right, so let's go, hold up, come back. All right, let's do the red protons here, right? So remember, these are equivalent. We, we talked about that, right? We talked about how you can test for equivalence by swapping a, a proton out on either side and then uh, with a different atom and comparing the two structures that you get from that, right? That's the test for equivalence. So here we have a, another singlet for these two protons, right? So how do we, why is that a singlet? If we look on the carbon that's adjacent to these, which is this carbon right here, are there any protons there? No. No, right? So for that set of protons, N equals zero. And it's gonna be the same for these three down here, but because they're equivalent, we don't have to do them separately, right? Dr. Russell. Go ahead. When you're looking at the protons, you're looking at the, um the H is above, right? And like the oxygen if need be, but mostly you're looking at the H's. Like when you're looking that's at all the I'm looking at. Yeah, okay. that's all I'm looking at because we're, right now we're talking about proton NMR, so hydrogen NMR. If I was doing a different type of NMR, then we'd be looking at a different atom. But for now, all I care about is the protons. All right, and then so for, for this would be a singlet, Right. And again, both sets, this, these three hydrogens and these three hydrogens, since they're identical, I don't have to, I'm not going to get two signals because if they're equivalent, they're going to fall under the same signal. Right. So that's why I'm only, that's why I only see one singlet for that because both of those sets are equivalent. But if you notice the height of that singlet, you see how tall it is relative to the other peaks. That, that's indicative of the fact that it's representative of more than just three hydrogens. We'll, we'll see that in the next uh, section when we talk about integration. All right. All right. Any questions about that one? All right. What about, let's do the pink set right here. It's a triplet. Why is it a triplet? Because it has two hydrogens attached to it. Attached to it, it or adjacent to neighboring it. them. Yes. So n in that case equals two, right? Because if you look at the pink set of protons right here, there are no hydrogens on this carbon. And then there are here two hydrogens on that carbon. So you always look at next door, right? What how many neighbors are to the left? How many neighbors are to the right? So n equals two, then the splitting pattern is going to be. Dr. Russell. Go ahead. I thought you counted the the group of hydrogens as one, not two. What? Okay, that's a good that's a good question, and I, and I understand exactly what you're saying. So when you're looking at 
the number of signals, you count them together, right? Because these two protons are equivalent to one another. So they're only gonna give you one signal. But when you're looking at that signal and what how many lines that signal is gonna be split into, right? Because again, you can see based on the NMR that each signal is not just a singlet, right? If there was no splitting, then everything would just be a singlet. Like in carbon NMR, when you turn the coupling off, every, all your lines are just singlets. There are no doublets or triplets or whatever. So when you're looking at the number of signals, like how many different sets of protons there are that are gonna give you a signal, then yes, you count them together. But when you talk, when you're trying to figure out the splitting pattern, then they are, uh, you count them. If it's two protons, then it's two protons. If it's three, it's three, right? If it's four, then it's four. You following? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question, good question. Somebody else was thinking that, but, but they were scared to say it. So good question. So that's a triplet. And then let's look at the two pentets. We should, this should be clicking at this point because it's just figuring out how many protons on the left, how many on the right to add them together and add one to it, right? So for the, let's do the uh, tail set right here, right? You got two protons on this side and two protons on that side. So for that one, N is gonna be what? Maybe four. And plus one is going to be five, and it'll be a pentet. All right, that's the reason it's a pentet <clears throat> is because this set of protons right here is going to give you that one signal, but because there are four neighboring protons, it's going to be split into five lines. All right, same thing here for the blue ones. You got two protons here, two here. So in that case, N is gonna be, <coughs> excuse me, one. I'm sorry, N is gonna be four. And then we do a little math. So that's also a pen tip. All right, any questions about the N plus one rule, splitting patterns, anything? No. All right, good, good, good. All right, let's move on to the uh, another topic, and then we're gonna go and work. We're gonna work some examples that'll put the put all this into application. All right. So the and the next. Uh, hold up. Let me clear this off. All right. So this is just explanation of the what we just talked about right so we already kind of explained the, the the n plus one and the fact that the signals the protons couple with other protons on adjacent atoms <clears throat> what you won't see and you can write this down if you have an oh like a hydroxyl proton it doesn't couple all right so you have an oh or an nh like an amine proton, they don't couple with neighboring protons. Even though, like in an alcohol or in an amine, you won't see any coupling with between that that atom. So NH, OH, you don't see the coupling. You might you'll see the signal sometimes depending on the strength of your magnet. You got like a good strong four or five hundred me uh, megahertz magnet, then you'll see the signal, but you won't see any coupling. All right. So this is just kind of an explanation of when you see coupling again if you have equivalent protons they don't split right if you have uh if they're more than an atom away it's very rare that you see long range coupling you can but it's rare uh like these three are all equivalent they're not going to split with each other only when you have non-equivalent protons on adjacent atoms that's when you see the splitting right so like right so something like this all four of these protons will show up under one signal because they're equivalent. All right. So now let's talk about uh, integration or proton count. So each signal is representative of a set of protons in the molecule. I'm, I'm saying set because if it's a CH2 or a CH3 or even a methane, like a CH 
proton. It's a set. It's it, it's gonna is if it's not equivalent, it's gonna give you a signal, right? So, uh, those signals you can do what's called integration. Uh, back in, I'm saying back in the day, back when NMR was first developed, you would actually have to integrate by hand, right? So you'll take a ruler and you'll measure a known signal that you know how many protons that signal gives and then use that as a reference. And the height of that signal is was used to calculate the number of protons for every other signal. So that was your reference. Uh, you don't have to do that anymore. Um, now you can just, in the program that we have, even at, um, at Tuskegee, the program we use, uh, top spin, now you have to do is drag the cursor over the signal and it'll integrate it for you, all right? So when we look at this set of protons or this molecule, right, we already know why we see this number of signals. We already know why this why the signals are split into a certain number of lines. And so now we, need, we can also um, determine how many protons each signal represents. And, and that's kind of basic when you look at the fact that we got it color coded and you can see how many protons each one of those colors represents, right? So right here for the orange set of protons, that's two hydrogens, right? So when you integrate that signal, basically put, a, put the curve over it and take the area under the curve. When you integrate it, it's gonna give you two hydrogens. It's gonna integrate for two hydrogens, right? When you integrate this signal, it's gonna integrate for three hydrogens, right? When you integrate the red signal, it's going to be six because both of those CH3s are equivalent and they're represented by the same signal. Same here. All, all three of these are going to rep, uh, be representative of two hydrogens. And the reason for that is each one of these atoms, each one of these carbons has two hydrogens attached to it. So here, here, and here, those are all two hydrogens. So that's why it's, that's why when you integrate right, it's going to integrate for uh, two hydrogens. And normally the integration, the curve will look something like this. Ah, that was, hold up, let me fix that. There's the undo button. The curve will look a little like this, right? So it'll be a curve, something like this, right? And then you just take the area underneath that curve and it'll tell you how many hydrogens that signal represents. And, and you would do that for each one of these signals, right? So here you would, you would, the curve will be here, and then same thing with all the rest of them. You'll have a curve here. And then when you take the area under the curve, it'll it'll give you the integration. All right. Any questions about the splitting, the number of signals, anything? The location. We're gonna we're gonna do some examples now. I need to I'm gonna share my iPad so we can work through a couple of examples in the time we have left. So that's the best way to learn in the market is just do it. All right. So let me, anybody need to screenshot this or anything before I switch to a different screen? All right. Come on. My computer is like a dinosaur this morning. It's already, well, it was always like a dinosaur, but it's worse today. All right. <laughs> Can everybody see that on the, uh, Examples on the screen where it says Kim 321 NMR assignment. This handout is in the chat. It's the first thing that I posted. So you might want to grab it so you can follow along because uh, it's, it's very difficult to reproduce these uh, spectra trying to draw by hand. So you might want to grab it so you can follow along. All right. So the first thing we're going to do on here is pick out the non-equivalent protons. All right. That's the first thing we're going to do. Right. And, and doing that, that's going to help us because th when we do that, we're going to know how many signals each one of these compounds should generate. All right, so let's start with number one, 
right? It's a skeletal structure, but you know that there's two protons here and there's two here, right? So how many signals will we get from this molecule? Not, not, not the splitting pattern, not the integrate, how many signals will we get when we take an NMR of this compound? Two, two butene, or uh, two, I'm sorry, two butanone, my bad. Will it be five? Okay, okay. Why, why would you say five? Are you looking at this carbon? There's no protons on that one now. So let's look at it. So you're close though, you're close, you're close. You got a signal for, for these three, All right? So that's gonna be a set. You have a signal for, let me change the color because they're all different. <clears throat> you have a signal for those. You're gonna have a signal for these and you'll have a signal for these, right? So you still, go ahead. I thought it was just supposed to be the adjacent ones. No, 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 you mixing up signals and splitting patterns. The signals, is, is that's gonna be based on how many types of non-equivalent protons you have, right? So if you got four different types of protons, you're gonna get four signals. If you got 10 different types, you're gonna get 10 signals. If you got three types, you'll get three signals. You following? Oh, so that's why it's four signals. Yes, because okay, you got okay. four different kinds of protons in here. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And none of them are equivalent to each other. So you're gonna, that's why you're gonna see four signals. All right, there are no hydrogens on, on this carbonyl, right? That carbon already has four bonds. Stop freezing. All right, yeah, that carbon already has four bonds, so you're not gonna have any protons there, right? So it's gonna be four signals. All right, let's do the next one. What about number two? Let's just do the chain first. Are there any equivalent protons on the chain? Keep in mind that even though it's skeletal, they're not written in, but we can write them in. Don't ever, don't ever feel like you can't do that. Would it be five? One, two, three, four. Okay, let's look at it. Would it be five, Dr. Russell? You're close. The CH3 is going to be a signal. Is that right? The one next to it is going to give you a different, because none of those are equivalent. You could, you could take off. Ooh, that that's bad. Hold up. It looks like a H2. It's just a number, a question, right? All right. You could take off any one of those protons and replace it with another atom, and you're going to get totally different structure each time. All right. So, so there, there's no equivalence on the chain. So that's one, that's two. Right. This one here is going to give you a signal, a separate signal. So that's three. And then right here is going to give you a separate signal. So that's four. And then you also have protons on that air. We've seen aromatics before, right? So you, you got a proton here and one here and then one here and one here, right? So there's a potential for each one of these to be separate, potential. But I think that uh, you're gonna have some equivalence with these two here and here, all right? And the up will say that the other two are, are going to be non-equivalent. So this is going to give you a signal and let me get a different color. That'll give you a signal, right? So that's a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven signals, a total, right? When we get to that example, I'll explain the equivalence on the, uh, on the aromatic ring. All right. So don't, don't panic about that. I'll, I'll explain it because with the aromatic, with the aromatic uh, system, you can have like, sometimes you have some symmetry with the ring, depending on where the line of symmetry is. And so sometimes those protons show up as equivalent. So we'll talk about that. Dr. So, Russell, yes. How come um, the two hydrogens on the top are like the same basically? Yeah, we're gonna talk about it. It's, it's basically like, again, with the aromatic, sometimes you can have some symmetry in the ring and you can rotate around a particular axis in a ring. Like for this ring, if we put an axis through here 
and rotate it around that axis, that's sometimes you'll see symmetry there. So we'll talk about this example when we get to it and I'll explain why those are equivalent and all that. All right, we're good with that for now? Yes. All right, let's go down to here. How many different signals are, are here? Three. Good. You're exactly right. One here, one here, and then if you've seen this pattern before, <clears throat> this kind of isopropyl type pattern, those are equivalent. Remember the OH? I mean, I say will not. It may or may not short signal. Right, that's really dependent on the magnet, how strong the magnet is. Sometimes the OH proton shows up, sometimes it doesn't, but what, what is always the case, it won't split. Right, it's not gonna couple with another set of protons. Because <clears throat> you can see that next to the OH, there's a CH2, is that right? Right here, and then there's a proton here as well. Right, so that's three, three, possibly four signals. So I'm gonna put that down here, three to four signals. Three to four signals. All right, questions about that one? So you don't count the H um, that's connected to the oxygen. You don't count that one, right? No, 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 no. That's why I said three to four, because it may show up, it may not show up. The three signals are coming from the highlighted uh, atoms, the yellow, the blue, and then the two red ones. Because remember, these are going to be equivalent. That This is just like the example we just looked at. So those two sets of protons are only going to give you one signal. Because they're equivalent. Those sets of those protons are equivalent. But they but they're not equivalent to anything else in the molecule. So that's gonna be a signal. And then that hydrogen that's right here uh, by itself is gonna give you a signal. And then the CH2 is gonna give you a signal. And the OH may or may not give you a signal. It just depends. All right. Now let's go back to, let's do the next one. What do you think? So wouldn't it just be um two? Or like you said, I don't know, like the um, the H3CO, it could be shown, but it could not so. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Only OH. We can only say that for OH. So then three. Those protons are on a carbon. Oh, so no, no, no. They're definitely going to show up. Wouldn't, this, wouldn't it be two because the H3 and H3 are equivalent? No, because if you look right here, mm -hmm. right, this CH3 is on oxygen. This CH3 is connected to another a carbon, so they're not the same. If it oh. was like this, I would agree with you. Okay, so wouldn't it be three then? Yes, it's three signals. Okay. So that's going that CH2 is going to give you a signal, and then this CH3 right here is going to give you a signal. So you'll have three different three signals for that. You should have you should recognize this molecule. I'm not saying you, but I'm saying it should be recognizable because it was in the video that I sent out on on a Wednesday. Uh, this is ethyl acetate, same same molecule that we used in that video. All right, so now we know this is going to be three signals. All right, so we got three signals for that one, possible uh, seven. Signals for the aromatic system, four signals for the first one, and then three to four signals for uh, number three. All right, so let's go to the first spectrum, and we're going to actually slide in a little bit of infrared. Uh, when we look at the, but, but I'll talk about that in a second, because I, I did send you our video also. 
So we'll talk about that shortly. So this has a molecular formula, C5H. And a lot of times, this is how your questions will be framed. Uh, if, in a kind of like, if you were looking at this in one of the old, older textbooks, it'll be framed just like this. They'll give you a spectrum, they'll give you a molecular formula, and they'll ask you to calculate what's called the IHD, index of hydrogen deficiency, uh, which we actually learned in part one, when we talked about, um, what, we, what were we talking about? Uh, and I'm drawing a blank. We were talking about the uh, alkenes and alkanes and, and the different uh, isomers, like we had to build isomers from a molecular formula, but the index of hydrogen deficiency is the same thing as um, the degrees of unsaturation. Do y'all remember calculating that? Where this was the formula yes. right here? It's uh, C, uh, I think it was 2N plus two. It was H, it was like H ref, uh, yeah. H molecule divided by two. Y'all remember that? Yep. That's yeah. the same, that, the IHD is the same thing as that, right? So what it tells you is the number of rings or uh, double bonds. Hold up now, come on, get your, get your mind right, Crossy. All right, so H ref minus H molecule div divided by two. That's the same, that's what the IHD is, index of hydrogen deficiency. It's the same thing as the degrees of unsaturation, right? So for that molecule, it would be uh, one, because it'll be H ref is 2N plus two, and then H molecule is 10, so it's two times, and N is the number of carbons, so it's 10 plus two is 12 minus 10, which is two over two, which would be one, right? So that means there's one ring or one double bond, right? Um, so when we look at the, the molecule itself, how many signals are we looking at? We got a signal here, a signal here. That's just a zoom of that signal, by the way. A signal here and a signal here. So that's four signals total, is that right? Yes. yes sir. So let's go back to that first page. How many of these did we have that would give us four signals? One. Um, uh, right. Okay, yeah. you're, you're right. It, it, it could be either one of these. Because I know what, where that hesitation came from, because we said that could be three or four, but let me show you why it's not the bottom one, right? If you look in the infrared, if this was an alcohol, that would be a huge stretch right here in the infrared, if it was an alcohol. But the fact that you don't see that stretch, that's how you, that's how you tie together IR and NMR, right? The fact that you don't see that alcohol stretch, the OH stretch, then you can rule out that bottom uh, compound. I think it was compound number three. So we're gonna take this one and we're gonna cut it out and I'm gonna paste it on the next page. All right, so you can rule. I, I'm, I'm glad that you had that hesitation. I think that was you, uh, Brittany. I'm glad I'm glad you hesitated with that. That was me. Yeah, yeah, but I'm glad though, because that tells me that you, you're thinking about both those compounds and, and one of them, both of them being able to have up to four signals. So. That's good. Okay, well, I want you paste. Oh, let me go back. I might not have copied it, knowing me. Come on, Russell. All right, there we go. One down here. All right. So let's let's look at it. Let's see what we can we can work with. Let's start with um, this signal right here. Right. And I want to let's start with the two triplets because this will also give me a chance to weave in some other information that we've already talked about. So with the first triplet, look at look at where it's located. And the second triplet, look at where that's located. So let's take that first triplet 
which uh, of those of, of all these protons in here, which two are going to give you triplets? In other words, which which two sets of protons have two neighbors? Because there are two of them that have it. Let's take the CH3 right here. How many neighbors does that set of protons have? So it's going to couple with these, isn't it? The ones right next door. Yes. So N for that would be two. N plus one would be three. So that's going to be a triplet. And then if you look at these down here, these are also going to couple with those two. So that's also going to be a triplet. Anybody disagree with that? So you got two triplets. Which one is upfield? Um, could you be able to tell like if it's upfield just by looking at the molecule? Like which one? Well, I guess not. Well, we can look at the spectrum. I, I, right? I was trying to understand how how could you tell if it's upfield or downfield if it's not on the chart? Look at the spectrum. Upfield means closer to zero, is that right? And downfield means further away from zero. So the two triplets on the on the spectrum, which one is further closer to zero? You got one at like zero point nine something. Is that right? I'm saying like if they both triplets, how do you differentiate between knowing like which one is switch triplet on the chart? Oh, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna talk about that. That's why I'm asking the question, which one is upfield and which one is downfield? So which one would you consider to be upfield? The one at 0.9 or the one at 2.4? 0.9. 0.9, it's, it's closer to zero. So this is up upfield. And then this is downfield. Right? Now, why is one upfield and one downfield? Remember when we talked about the chemical shift, the location is based on whether or not it's in an electron rich environment or an electron poor environment. So when we looked at that chart with all those different shifts on it, one of the, one of the shifts on that chart showed a, pro, a set of protons like this that was adjacent to a sp2 carbon. And they show up in the exact same place every time, somewhere between two and two and a half. You following? And so with that set of protons being connected to the carbonyl or being on a carbon that's connected to the carbonyl, they're going to be deshielded. And so that's why this one we can say is the proton at, uh, I'm just going to color code it at 2.4. Right? Same, I'm, I'm putting it as the same color of, as it is in the molecule. The reason it's downfield is because it's next door to that carbonyl. Yes or no? Oh, okay. So this was like the question I had about the, the question on a YouTube quiz. Mm -hmm. So, so hmm, I'm trying to explain it right. Um, so when the pro when the proton is adjacent to the carbonyl group, mm -hmm. it'll be uh, it's gonna, it's just going to be more deshielded de de just because. Yeah. Or, okay. Because the carbon in the carbonyl is sp2 hybridized, so it's going to be more electronegative. So it's pulling the electron density away from those protons and deshielding. So, why is the other one so far up, Phil? The other triplet. What's the, what's, the, is it a coincidence that it's further away from that? It's not because it's, I bet. You can go. Go ahead. No, go, Brett. Because it's not adjacent to the carbonyl. It's further down. It's just a regular alkyl set of protons. If you if you go back in that handout from the that I posted from the PowerPoint, there's a chart in there that tells you where every type of proton is supposed to show up. Right? So the, the car, protons that are adjacent to sp2 carbons that show up at about two between two and two and a half unless it's on an aromatic ring and it's further down because those are all sp2 as well but that's a different type of system 
All right, let's look at uh, wh where is that singlet coming from? Oh, I, 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 I made that the wrong color too. Nobody caught that, but I just did. It's gonna be the pink one, my bad. So that's pink and then this one is red. So we got those two figured out, all right? Now, now let's do the singlet. Which one of those is gonna be a singlet? And how do you know? Uh, the green one. The green one, good. No neighbors, right? Right. If you look at that set of protons, that CH3, the carbon next door to it has no hydrogens on it. So it's not gonna have, it's not gonna have anything to couple with. All right. Sorry about the lag. And the last one, because I know we gotta go. Let's look at that multiplet. What do you think? We we got all the other ones picked out. So what do you think? There's only one left, right? Yeah, the blue, um, the blue one. It's here. All right, but now let's look at what it, how it's split, because I wanna, I don't want us to lose that. Look at the splitting pattern. How many lines is that? So it's one, two, three, four, five, six lines. What does that mean? If if the signal is six lines, how many neighbors does that signal? Uh, five. Good. That proton or that set of protons that that signal represents should have five neighbors. So if we go back over here and look at the blue protons, you can see it, right? You got two on this side. I'm gonna change the color of my pen right quick. You got two on that side, you got three on that side. Is that right for these protons right here? Yes. Mm -hmm. So N for that, N is equal to five. And then N plus one is six. So that should be a sextet. And you can see up here, it's a sextet. The other other thing that we could tell from this is if we look at the integration, we could pick out the protons like that as well, right? The one at two, the signal at 2.4 integrates, see the little number over the top? Right here, that's the integration. So that's telling you how many, come on now, that's a lag, I got them highlighted, but it's lagging. That's, that, that's telling you how many protons each one of those signals represents. So you can see the pink one uh, is two protons and you can see that uh, singlet is three protons. We already said it's, it's for that CH3. Uh, and then the pentet or sextet, I'm sorry, is two protons. You can see it highlighted in blue and then it highlighted at the very end, the CH3 at the end, highlighted in red, integrates for three protons. All right. The only other thing that I'll I'll point out for, for, for this example is in the infrared, because I did send you that. You should have watched that video by now. Uh, the two stretches here and here are the important stretches for that molecule. This is alkyl stretching, right? So that long alkyl chain, and anytime you have an alkyl chain in your molecule, that's where it's gonna show up in the infrared. Right, somewhere about 2,900 to 3,000. And it's gonna have that jagged look to it. And then the other important stretch right here is the ketone stretch. Because remember, infrared tells you about functional groups. What functional groups are present. So every functional group got, has its own infrared stretch. We're gonna look at, at more of this on uh, Monday. All right, any questions about anything before we sign off? I don't have a question, but um, this is a really good lecture today. I was really involved and it helped me understand some things. Good, good. That's good to hear. That, that just made my day. Yep. All right. Um, any Anything else before we log out? Oh, I, I asked to mute you after, but you clarified what I had a question about in class today. Right. Um, but I did have one more thing to ask you. So okay. You want to put it in the chat? And then uh, and, uh, just send it to me in the chat, in a private yeah. chat, and I'll respond back. Mm -hmm. Unless it's something you don't mind, like share. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. All right. So any, if there are no other questions, you can log out, and uh, I'll see y'all on. Let me stop recording so they don't hear our, our, our personal talks. Um,